grateful for this opportunity to stand before you and speak, especially on the Lord's Day. If you would be turning to the book of Hebrews, particularly chapter 4, we'll be spending a decent amount of time there this morning and discussing some qualities of God's Word. Now, we often quote this passage or at least reference it in discussing different attributes of God's Word, at least one of them, that is, it being powerful. But as we stated, I would like this morning to spend a great, meal, great deal of thought and time on verse 12. But, we, but before we get there, we must keep in mind the context. And we could see that in Hebrews chapter 3, verses 7 through uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 8. Throughout these passages, the writer of the book of Hebrews is dealing with the children of Israel. And he's calling to mind the different things that they did, and even the things that they didn't do. And as a result of their unbelief, they were punished. So very few of the children of Israel were actually allowed to enter into the land of promise. Which would bring us to this morning's text. So as we stated, Hebrews chapter 4, we'll begin there in verse 9 and read through 13. The writer here pens, There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into, the, into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief, hearkening back to Israel. In verse 12, Having all these things in mind, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. So this morning I would like to take these few moments to break down verse 12 in this passage to study it phrase by phrase and see how it applies to us today. So the first phrase we would like to consider is the word of God is quick and powerful. First off, what exactly is the word being referenced here? Some have made the claim that the word referenced here is actually a term hearkening back to Jesus, who is the eternal word. John chapter 1 verses 1 through 3. It is this word who put on flesh, John chapter 1, verse 14. Though these different aspects are true, the word referenced here in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, cannot be the second person of the Godhead. And we'll see this as the lesson progresses. So since it is the case that Jesus, at least in this verse, is not being referenced as the word of God specifically, it must be referencing the entire body of truth contained in words. It is called the word of hearing, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. It is the word which we must hear. It is the word that builds our faith. It is also called the word of salvation, Acts chapter 13, verse 26. Thus, it is the instrument... The instrument used by Jesus throughout the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 1 verse 16. Chapter 2 verse 12. Chapter 19 verse 15 and verse 23. There it is called the, the sword that proceeds out of his mouth. So really you have the word, the eternal word, using the written word in those instances. This word referenced is the standard by which we all must live by and we all must and will be judged by. John chapter 12, verse 48. This is not a law only for the Christians, 
This is a law that the entire world will be judged by. Every accountable person will be judged by this word. And thankfully, we have this word contained in book form for us today. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Next, we see in this phrase that this word is quick and powerful. Quick is another term for being alive. It's alive, it's active. Should this surprise us at all, knowing that the origin of this word is also living? Is life himself? God is life. God is living. This word is upheld by the very fountain of life. Psalm uh, 36, the first part of verse 9. For with thee is the fountain of life. Speaking of God in that verse. This word is a living and concrete embodiment of God's will. We must always keep this in mind. Consider Isaiah chapter 55, verses 10 through 11. <clears throat> the great prophet of old here pens, For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not, not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth, and bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I send it. You see, this word has a purpose. There is a design to it. And it will, it not that it might, it will accomplish God's plan. Now, I don't have a hatchet, but I do have a prop. This is a very pretty book. This is Homer's Iliad and the Odyssey. It's got this nice blue cover, a little uh, picture that would represent what they might have had on the pottery used at this time. It's even got gold pages. It's a very thick book. It might even stop a bullet. Who knows? I'm not going to find out. If you read this book, you'll have a greater knowledge and understanding of the Greek mythology. And it might spur your, your imagination. But at the end of the day, it's still fiction. It's still fiction. Now compare this to the Word of God. You know, I could stand on this book and it would make me probably two and a half inches taller. I don't need the help. But I can metaphorically stand on the Word of God and never falter. It is what is right and can never be wrong. It is God's truth contained in words. You cannot say that the Iliad or the Odyssey, written by Homer, is alive and active. It's a nice piece of fiction, but it has no bearing on my life today, especially as a Christian. Now, as we said, we could, we could read it for our entertainment, but at the end of the day, that's all it is is a piece of fiction entertainment. Not so with the Word of God. It has a purpose, and it will accomplish that purpose. That purpose is to get man to God, to bring him to heaven. Thus, this Word of God serves as our pattern, which we must follow. Romans chapter 6, verse 17. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13. Now, hand in hand with the concept of being living or quick is the term powerful or really authoritative. Again, should we be surprised that the word of God should be authoritative or powerful? After all, the Father has all authority. And we know that he's given all authority to Christ on heaven and on earth. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20 there. But the Father has inherent authority. Jesus has been given delegated authority. And everyone alive has been given some sort of delegated authority. You think of the fathers running the house, ruling over the house. They have delegated authority. And they would delegate that authority to others in helping 
run that house. Naturally, the wife is supposed to guide the home. Again, delegated authority. You think of everyone in power today, government-related. They think they have all power, but they don't. They have delegated authority. Thus, the father is the source of all power, all authority in this life. Romans chapter 13, verse 1. We have there written, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Jesus proclaimed this principle to Pilate in his mock trial, John chapter 19, verse 11. You wouldn't have any power to do this to me unless it were given to you. And ultimately, God is the one who gives power. Government is a God-ordained institution. Thus, men should be elected by whatever means to fulfill that role, and they will be held accountable for how they use that role. But while in effect, we are, especially as Christians, subject to their rule. This word is God's power unto salvation. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. It has the ability to turn the world upside down. Acts chapter 17, verse 6. Better stated, it has the ability, the power, to turn it right side up. But to those doing wrong for so long, it would be considered upside down. The Word of God has the ability to tear down strongholds. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 through 5. And it was by the faith in this, po this powerful Word that those of old were able to watch the walls of Jericho fall. Joshua chapter 6. God said these things would occur. Obey his will and they did occur. So God's word is alive. It is powerful. It serves a purpose and it has the ability to accomplish that purpose. Secondly, our phrase there in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 sharper than any two-edged sword. You see, the Word of God is the most effective instrument or weapon in human history. One of my favorite, I guess, cultures in, in throughout history would be that of Japan, particularly the samurai. I've always been fascinated by the samurai, specifically with their swords, their katanas, they're even the wakazashis. You'd have to read about how they would use those weapons and, and where they would use those weapons. That's why they have several of them. But you look at how they made these swords and the different metallurgical processes that they used and implemented. It took us many years to understand what they were actually doing. But they had, that sword had one fatal weakness. You see, it only had one edge. So when you're in the heat of battle and you swing that sword at somebody, let's say you miss or you didn't actually strike a fatal blow, you'd actually have to make another swing to hit them again. Now, compare that to a two-edged sword. Let's say you have the same problem. You, you hit them once, but you didn't strike a, a fatal blow, you could also cut them again while you come back. You see, you just saved one action as a soldier. Efficiency matter, matters in battle. So the two-edged sword is far more efficient than a single-edged sword. Now, during the time of the first century, the Roman spatha was, was a representation of the best there was in swords at the time. Weapons of war. You can look throughout human history. We've had swords for a great many years, probably 6,000, 7,000 years of our history. But they were weak when we first started out using them. Why? Because of the different metals we used. Some metals are softer than others. Well, it took process of time and experiments and trial and error, losing wars to find out there are better metals out there. Well, by the time of the Roman reign, maybe they didn't perfect metallurgy, but they certainly knew which blades were better. 
And they had, as we said, this Roman spatha, which was a two-edged sword, and that was used quite frequently. They knew about it. They knew that it was a successful weapon, and others did too. All of this considered, the word of God is better than all of these. The katana, my personal favorite, the wakazashi, second to it. And then you have the Roman spatha, and every other sword in between. Even those that might be two-edged, that were not Roman. The word of God trumps them all. Ultimately, we see that this weapon, this sword, this two-edged sword, used by Christ. As we've stated earlier, Revelation chapter 19, verse 15. He's using this weapon to pass judgment on all the nations. It thus follows that this should be the weapon of choice for the Christian today. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 17. After all, the sword of the Spirit is our only offensive weapon. You look at the Christian armor. Every other piece is designed to be a defensive, of, or a defensive use. The sword of the Spirit is the only tool of offense. And we are to use it correctly. Part of handling aright the Word of God is knowing how to use it in the specific instances we're put in. Now you think about today the metaphorical use of a, a double-edged sword. It means it's going to cut you and the one that you're aiming to cut. So you could say it cuts coming and going. I think Brother Keeble had coined that term a while back. But that is indeed the case. It's not a bad thing, but it, it shows the, the ability of God, His nature, if you will, that He does not respect persons. You see, many today use the Word of God in a way that this applies to you, but I can do whatever I want. Properly using God's word, it is true for you, just as it is true for me. So it cuts you and me. It cuts coming and going. It applies to all and not just a small group, especially the ones it's used on. Third, we consider piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and a discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart. It's quite a large phrase, but these different thoughts are all connected, so we're going to tackle them all at once. You see, the Word of God, this sword, is able to pierce and divide to the extent of the soul and spirit. Now, what is this concept of soul and spirit? Since the uh, year 500 B.C., those surrounding years, um, you had Pythagoras. And in year 350 B.C., you had Plato. Well, these philosophers, these great thinkers, many of us are familiar with them, especially if you've taken an algebra class or geometry. You probably hate Pythagorean theorem. But nonetheless, they were great thinkers. Well, during this time, they claimed that man was made up of a trinity, in fact, it was the doctrine of the trinity of human nature. Well, man consists, at least to their doctrine, of three distinct parts. The material body, which was the soma. The animal soul, suke, which would represent the instincts, passions, and fleshly appetites. And then you have the immortal spirit, tanuma which would be the seat of higher intellectual and moral faculties. Well, regardless of what you might call that, that is still a biblical concept of soul, spirit, and body. These terms, though, might not be exactly how we use them today, but they are outlined in Scripture. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, there Moses pins that God made our physical body and he breathed the breath of life into Adam's nostrils. He gave Adam a physical body, and he gave him biological life. But you see, God also gave us an immortal spirit. 
Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 27, as well as Hebrews chapter 12, verse 9. There it says, He fathers our spirits. So these three different pieces come together to make a whole of man, a physical body, which was made from the dust of the earth, the biological life, which you can be breathing in and out, your body functions accordingly, and then your immortal spirit, which will leave this fleshly body when this life is over and return to God who gave it and will ultimately reside in one of two places, heaven or hell, based on how we live in this life. Paul references this concept in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. He there says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, in order to be faithful to God, these three pieces of man must be blameless. They must be pure. If we are to obtain heaven when this life is over. And indeed, that should be the goal of everyone in existence today. What about the joints and marrow? Now this phrase is employed metaphorically, figuratively, of those more innermost parts of man. Really they could be employed to represent anything innermost, but in our context, specifically mankind. In this case, it demonstrates the extent and how thorough God's word pierces us. It shows the extreme dividing process. Thus we can state that the word of God is living and active. It is full of power, energy, and authority. It is able to divide and lay bare the soul and spirit, even to the extent of our joints and marrows. You could easily say that it permeates our very being. That's the concept that's being laid out here in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12. Ultimately, the word of God is designed to enter into the realms of thought, idea, affection, and desires. And once occupied, or occupies that position, it is able to pass judgment on the thoughts of that individual and the purposes of that individual's heart. This is how Paul can rightfully pen in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete or perfect, throughly furnished, unto every good work. You cannot be thoroughly or, th or thoroughly furnished if the word has no ability to permeate your entire being. You think of a sponge and it's dry. You pour water on it. Sponges are excellent at absorbing anything, specifically water. But that water is able to permeate that entire sponge. In that instance, the word of God would be the water we need to be that sponge. We need to be absorbing God's word. After all, it will have the effect that God intended on us. It will rule our lives. We will will our will to God's will. That is, after all, how things should be done. God's word has the ability to do that. Now, if the Word of God has this ability regarding us, it would make sense, it follows, that its author possesses the exact same ability. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13, we read it earlier, but we'll read it one more time. There it says, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. You see, God's word is a dividing sword. It makes sense that God has the same ability. You see, before him, all of creation is naked. It's manifest. 
It's made plain. It's open. It's exposed to him. As such, all those who are accountable to him will be held accountable. And they must, of necessity, will of necessity, give an account of their deeds done in this body. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. Furthermore, our thoughts and our motives are plain to him. He can see what we're thinking. He knows our motives behind the things that we do. You know, as Christians, we have works. James tells us that. He also tells us, I will by my works show you my faith. We can do good works. We can also do bad works. But we can hide our thoughts. We can hide our motives, our attitudes to some extent. And many people throughout time have been very good at hiding their motives from others. But we cannot hide those motives, those thoughts from God. He is our creator. He put us together. He knows everything about us. Thus it would follow that his word can show us the things that we don't like to reveal to others. I might go out and do a good deed. But I might have bad intentions for doing it. I might be trying to work things to where I might gain power. I might gain prestige. might gain money out of it. Don't you think that's the whole realm of politics? It was said one time in a movie that, you know, I'm a politician. If I'm not kissing babies, I'm stealing their lollipops. That's a prevalent idea of many of our politicians and unfortunately many people in the church I'm going to do this make you like me but my ulterior motives which you will never know about of course uh, if the plan goes according to everything that's been worked out you'll never know those motives but God does God knows our motives he knows our hearts all that we think all that we say all that we do will be and is fully analyzed and even classified by our Creator. The righteous judge, the infallible judge. He's not partial. If you've done wrong, you deserve to be punished for it. This is how we can say that the Word of God is the perfect law of liberty. And we're able to look at it as if we're looking into a mirror because it's going to show us exactly how God sees us. You go into the mirror at home, you comb your hair. I like keeping my hair short so I don't have to comb my hair. If I have to start combing it, it's time to cut the hair off. It's getting close to that time. I used to part my hair down the side, and you'd have your little comb and your hair gel, and you'd make sure that every hair was in place. And nobody dare look at it because otherwise a couple strands might get out of place. God's word is going to tell you where your error is. But you have to look at it first, and most people ignore it altogether. Nonetheless, John chapter 12, verse 48 says, we will be judged by that word. If we use our lives without thought of God, we will be held accountable for those actions. You can't claim ignorance. I didn't know who you were, God. No, God has given adequate evidence to point to the fact, not that theory of God, but the fact of God's existence, and he therefore expects us to seek him out and to do his will. And for us today to examine that perfect law of liberty, particularly the New Testament of Jesus the Christ. Using that law of liberty, we are to examine ourselves to see if we be in the faith. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. Otherwise, we ourselves might be reprobate, disqualified to obtain heaven through the actions, the sins that we've committed. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 verses 13 and 14 well states that our whole, the very duty of our existence is to seek God, to fear Him, and to do His commandments. If we squander this life, we have no one but no one to blame but ourselves. As we draw this lesson to a close,
we need to keep in mind that the writer of Hebrews used the children of Israel as our example. Romans 15, 4. All those things happen for our learning. You see, the children of Israel, they were promised deliverance from Egyptian, Egyptian bondage, captivity. And if they were to be faithful to God, they would be granted entrance into the land of promise. But so many of them, even Moses himself, sinned against God. And they were all punished for it. But those many years wandering in the wilderness, for us today is the same type of labor as Christians that we must endure. Persecution, outright laboring for God. But as the writer here says in verse 10 of Hebrews 4, For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his, hearkening back to the seventh day of creation. God stopped his creative acts. We as mere mortals, we are put here to serve God. And if we're faithful to God in all things, we're granted that time of rest at our death. Revelation 2 verse 10. From these different passages, we've considered the nature of God's word. It is alive. It applies to us today. It is a form of doctrine which we must adhere to and preach to others and live out in our own lives. This word has saving power. And this word has the ability to make us holy. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. Be ye holy, for I am holy. God's not going to demand something that we cannot do for ourselves. We have the ability to understand his word, to properly apply it. Put those things into practice. In so doing, we become holy. Meet for the master's use. Now being compliant with this word, as we said, leads us to the rest when this life is over. However, being disobedient to it now leads to torment and hell. Have you rendered obedience to God's will this morning? If you have, are you rendering obedience now? You see, there's a difference of terminology there because there's a difference of lifestyle. If you've not rendered obedience to God's word, why not do that this morning? Become a Christian. Follow his plan of salvation. If you've already done that, continue rendering obedience to him. If you've stopped, repentance and prayer will restore that relationship between you and your creator. Whatever need there might be this morning, please make it known as together we stand and sing.